Joe Goodrich, why don't you come up and perform? I've spent the last six months in the rare book room of the New York Public Library researching a book, as Charles mentioned, on the writer S.N. Behrman and his 40-year relationship with the New Yorker magazine. One of the pleasures of this project is the opportunity it affords me to steep myself in Behrman's prose. Um, and I'd like to share some of that prose with you tonight. This is a segment from Malach Hamovis, which is Yiddish for the Angel of Death. It was first published in the January 26, 1952 issue of the New Yorker. Our tenement on Providence Street, besides housing my parents, my two older brothers, and me, was heavily populated with angels. Every night, as I was falling asleep, I would hear my father through the door that separated me from the kitchen, pacing back and forth and intoning in Hebrew his evening prayer, which he would repeat three times. Its mournful cadences ended with the words by which, before committing himself to sleep, he invoked attendant presences. And may the angel Michael be at my right hand, Gabriel on my left, before me, Uriel behind me, Raphael, and over my head, the divine presence of God. As long as I can remember, I was acutely aware of this quartet of angels and felt that their general disposition was protective and friendly. Indeed, I often called upon them to help me in my desperate nocturnal wrestlings with a fifth and sinister angel, who also, and unwelcomely, persisted in staying with us on Providence Street. This was the Malach Hamovis, the angel of death, a familiar character in Jewish folklore who was very real to me because of the constant references to him in the conversation of my father and his friends. The very sound of his name was dark, hooded, penetrating, and the personality it evoked jealous and implacable. The form of my struggle, its terrain and its tactics, was always the same. It was a fixed dream of horror, which came to me early in the evening. It had settled upon me when I first began to have a dim notion of what death meant. Perhaps my antagonist was the more vividly embodied for me because my mother, from the earliest time I can remember, was intermittently pronounced to be dying. She suffered from asthma, and her prolonged suffocations in her incense-laden room were struggles I identified as daytime versions of my own nocturnal bouts with the Malach Hamovis. Sometimes on late, summer, on late summer or early fall nights, after a day of swimming or canoeing at Lake Quinsigamond, I would go to bed exhausted and drowsed, pleasantly at first, revolving in my mind the hazards and excitements of the day. Presently, there would come through to me from the next room my father's measured pacing and the creak of the floorboards while he intoned softly but distinctly his prayer. The words, although I did not understand them all, had become familiar to me, syllable by syllable, and their cadence was so unvarying that it took the place of words that had meaning. Their unbroken modulation was always sad, but it was also soothing. This sedative effect lasted until, at the very end of the prayer, the four angels made their entrance. By this time, I had moved too far towards sleep to turn back, but I held on desperately to the filaments of consciousness until the four angels should reappear when my father repeated the prayer. I knew that to lose hold entirely left me open to the stern visitation from the other, and I fought off sleep because I did not want to be alone when he came. Never once in my numberless encounters did I see the Malach Hamovis make his entrance. He always just materialized and was standing by my bed looking down at me. He was monkish, soberly gowned and very tall with a long, thin face and an expression that was detached and not in the least hostile. I slept on a white painted iron bed the headboard was a frame with short posts at each side that terminated in the unexpected elegance of brass knobs. The metal runners that supported the bed springs were round and easy to grasp. 
Since it was the angel's object to get, to get me out of bed and take me away with him, I would turn on my side and seize a runner with one hand and with the other clutch the brass knob over my head. This position, a sort of lopsided crucifixion, was awkward and eventually fatiguing, but it meant that I was already holding on ferociously when the angel reached out to take me. There followed a tug of war. I held on for dear life until the pain in my fingers became almost insupportable. To hold on to some part of the bed, to maintain contact with it, became the essence of survival, and the bed seemed to be the only familiar thing in a swirling and fearsome unknown. Yet a moment always came when I knew I had to give in and felt my fingers begin to relax. I was lost and awoke screaming. One night, during an unusually severe attack of my mother's, I was lying in bed and heard my father and my brothers in the kitchen repeating in hushed voices what our family physician, Dr. Jim Nightingale, had told them, that they must prepare for the worst, that my mother would probably not live through the night. My father must not have gone to bed at all that night, for I did not hear his prayer, but I did not need the entrance of the amiable four to evoke the other since he was in the flat already, busy in my mother's room. When I could hold on no longer and was about to cry out, I was awakened by my father. To my surprise, I could see first light coming in the windows. My father stood where the angel had stood. I waited for him to tell me that my mother was dead. I was afraid that even though I had won, she had lost. But my father said only that my mother was very bad. He wanted me to get dressed quickly and go with him to fetch Dr. Nightingale while my brothers stayed with my mother. I left the house with my father to fetch Dr. Nightingale at a little before five that morning. It was early September. The leaves of the trees were still a summer green, and there lingered among the branches a faint, milky fog which the sun had not yet washed away, although the floating wisps were already translucent with pink light. The air was soft and full, but with an intimation of sharpness, an edge of something that was not summer. I was conscious of the prodigality of the air, so abundant and ample and circumambient. Perhaps this consciousness was heightened by the realization that my mother was in her room, suffocating for lack of it. In the limpid melting together of summer and fall, there was the fullness of expectancy and the merest hint of farewell. The fear of death had never been so vivid to me before, nor has it ever been since. And yet I felt, as I walked down the hill, a kind of pride in my own indestructibility and a certain impatience with my mother for dying. The doctor had said that she might die, and people did die. I knew what it was to struggle with death. I did not know, nor could I imagine, what it was to die. The brass plaque bearing the legend James Nightingale, MD, was filmed with dew when we pressed the electric button beneath it. The doctor opened the door almost at once. He already had his trousers on and was slipping his suspenders over his shoulders. I returned on foot. On the way back, I wondered whether my mother would be dead when I arrived and if so, what she would look like. Suddenly, the whole idea of my mother's problem became infinitely remote, even uninteresting. Definitely, death was the concern of other people. But when I reached our tenement, I had a deep wish not to go into the house, for I was sure everything was over, and I was afraid of seeing, for the first time, the angel's handiwork. My mother was sitting up in her bed, propped against a stack of pillows. The air of the room was damp and heavy with foreign matter. My father and my brother stood around the bed watching. Her eyes were closed and her face was tilted up as if she were trying to reach some untapped reservoir of air. She opened her eyes and looked at me. I hoped for recognition, for a ghost of her unfailing smile, but she closed her eyes again as though she had not seen me. This frightened me and for a moment I felt helpless. Dr. Nightingale turned to the others and shook his head as if he felt helpless too. It seemed to me that this was my opportunity. I would close her hand over the iron rail of the frame 
and clasp it there, held in my own. I would never let go. But when I looked at her hand, I was shocked because I saw that it was limp and enervated. I could not relate it to my mother's hand as I knew it, deft and nimble at the stove or at her sewing. It was not her hand or anyone's hand. I looked at my mother's face in a dreadful apprehension that any moment I might see it become as helpless as her hand. I ran out of the room and out of the house into the airy, delicious early morning. Thank you.